Hello, and it's good to see you again. And God bless you. I hope you are blessed today. And uh, today we're going to start chapter 10 of the Gospel of Matthew. And, um, well, let's open in prayer and we'll see where God takes us. So, dear Lord, we just come to you today. And, Father, we ask, Almighty God, for your blessing, O Lord Jesus. We ask, God, that you'd send your Spirit, O Lord, to open this word to us and, and give us understanding. Lord, we love you. We want you in our lives, O God, and we ask that you be with us, O Lord. Help us, O Lord, to follow you and follow you closely, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So, um, today we're going to start out Matthew chapter 10, and we'll just look at half the chapter. It's a kind of a long chapter, about 42 verses long. We'll just cover the first 23 verses. Now, uh, Matthew chapter 10, it starts out where Jesus sends out the 12 apostles, and he sends them out in his power and authority uh, to do the same miracles that he did. Now, if we think back on uh, the previous chapter, last week's lesson, the last half of uh, Matthew chapter 9, uh, the last verse there in nine, chapter 9, verse 38 says, um, So pray to the Lord who is in charge of the harvest. Ask him to send more workers into his field. And, you know, so he said that ending the last chapter, and then he begins this chapter by uh, naming the 12 disciples and sending them out into the field for the harvest. And uh, that's just our Lord's way. He's preparing us for it. And, you know, it's our call, too. Uh, whether we go near or far or, or just where we're living, um, you know, we are to be the Lord's servants and to... Uh, share his method message the best we can so let's start reading now in matthew chapter 10 verse 1 it says uh, verse 1 so jesus called his 12 disciples together and he gave them authority to cast out evil spirits and to heal every kind of disease and illness Wow. So he called the 12 disciples together. And you know, the 12 disciples, disciple, the word disciple, it means a learner. So Jesus was their teacher and they were learning and he called the 12. You know, he had many more disciples than that, but the 12 we know later became the 12 apostles or later were called that. And he gave them authority. Imagine that. To do what? To cast out evil spirits and to heal every kind of disease and illness. Those are the very same miracles that Jesus himself did. So he was like extending his ministry rather than and uh, just one man going out with the, the gospel of the kingdom, uh, he was sending 12 out so they could cover more grounds and, and Israel could be more prepared and all of Israel had a better chance of hearing the word of God. And then it goes into uh, the names of these apostles and uh, the next uh, verses two through four, it says, here are the names of the 12 apostles. And first was Simon, who is also called Peter, and then Andrew, Peter's brother. So there's a pair of brothers. Remember Peter and Andrew, they were fishermen. Okay, and then there was James, the son of Zebedee, and John, James' brother, another pair of brothers, and they too were fishermen with that. And then verse 3 says, and then there was Philip and Bartholomew. Now, we don't know too much about Philip and Bartholomew, except they're from, I believe, Bethesda, uh, which is around the Sea of Galilee. And Thomas, he was called Didymus. Uh, Didymus means twin, and they believe he had a twin brother. And so he was called, we refer to him sometimes as Doubting Thomas, because he had uh, trouble believing that Jesus rose again from the dead until he saw Jesus. Well, that changed everything, uh, didn't it? So there's Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector. He's a man. Isn't this amazing? This tax collector is the guy who wrote the book we're reading here, uh, the Gospel of Matthew. And remember, in the last chapter, Jesus just called him, and he walked away from his tax collecting booth and changed his whole life. And he followed the Lord Jesus. Well, he's named now. So Matthew's a tax collector, and James, the son of Alphaeus. I don't know too much about him. And Thaddeus, the only thing we know about him is that he may have been called um, Judas at one time too. And uh, verse 4, Simon the Zealot. Uh, a zealot, he was uh, with a political group that uh, really worked for the overthrow of the Roman government. But uh, Jesus called him to become a disciple. You know, he calls people from all walks of life, right? We see a tax collectors here, some fishermen here, some people that we don't know about. Here a zealot. And then the last one named in the last half of verse 4. We'll read all verse 4 again. So Simon was a zealot and Judas is carried who later betrayed him. You know, in every place that we see uh, the the, God, the um, apostles listed, it always starts with the name of Peter, because he was the predominant one. Uh, I guess he was kind of the leading apostle. And it always ends with Judas Iscariot, the one who betrayed Jesus. So that always, the order in between might change, but it's always the first and the last are those two. 
So let's see what he does with these 12 apostles here, or disciples. Verse 5, so Jesus sent out the 12 apostles with these instructions. He said, now, don't go to the Gentiles or to the Samaritans, but only to the people of Israel, God's lost sheep. So he sends them out and he's giving them guidelines, a parameter to work within. Go only to God's people, only to the people of Israel, God's lost sheep. You know, they were the chosen ones. They were the ones that God had chosen uh, to be the first to know about him and about the his son, Jesus Christ. And so they were to go and, and sort of recover this lost nation of Israel uh, that they were doing. And they weren't to go to the Gentiles. The Gentiles were all the other people in the world, nor the Samaritans. Now, Samaritans, they lived um, kind of like south of the Sea of Galilee. Let's see, the Sea of Galilee is in the northern part of Israel and north of the southern part of Israel. Uh, around Jerusalem. So they lived right in between there. And uh, why they were called Samaritans is in 722 BC, so 722 years before Christ was born, um, the northern part of Israel had backslidden and turned away from God. So God allowed the Assyrians to come and overthrow that kingdom. And uh, with that, they took many of the people out and dispersed them among the nations. And some they left there, but they also brought Gentiles to live in the land with these. And they ended up intermarrying. And so these Samaritans were half breeds. They were half Jewish and half Gentiles. And the pure Jewish people hated them for that. So they were known as a different. Remember that the Jewish people, if they were going from Jerusalem up to the Sea of Galilee, they wouldn't go straight up through the through the Samaritan country. They would cross the Jordan River on the east and go up around Samaria and come back in uh, just south of the Sea of Galilee. That's how they how much they were hated. But now, so he's telling them here in verse um, five, Jesus sent out the twelve apostles with these instructions. He said. Don't go to the Gentiles or the Samaritans, but only to the people of Israel, God's lost sheep. And then he tells them what to do. Verse 7, go and announce to them the kingdom of heaven is near. Announce to them, you know, the Messiah is here, right? The kingdom is coming uh, very, very close to you now. And they needed to hear that good news. You know, that was the most important thing about Jesus. He didn't come so much to work miracles, although he did those as signs to prove that he was who he said he was. Uh, he came sometimes and he did miracles in compassion to heal people and things. But mainly he was concerned about their spiritual life. Remember when uh, last week we talked about the uh, the man that was paralyzed and he was carried in his bed by, by some people and they let him down through the roof to see Jesus. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the man on the, on the, on the mat laying on the floor, he said, your sins are forgiven, which was kind of shocking. You'd think he'd say you're healed. But uh, the Pharisees, well, they thought, well, this is blasphemy. He, he can't forgive sins. Only God can do that. And Jesus said, well, what's easier to say? Your sins are forgiven or Arise, take up your mat, and go home. You know, well, it's easy to say your sins are forgiven because nobody can prove you can't, they're not, or, not, or anything. But to say, get up, take up your mat, and go home, well, that'd be that'd be pretty good evidence. So he says, but so you know that I have power to forgive sins. He turned to the paralyzed man. He said, get up, take up your mat, and go home. And the mat and a man immediately arose up and picked up his mat and went home, showing that. So now he's sending out the disciples here, and he says in verse seven again, go and announce to them that the kingdom of heaven is near. And here's what you're to do. Verse eight, heal the sick, raise the dead, cure those with leprosy, and cast out demons. Give as freely as you have received. You know, these are the very same miracles that Jesus did. Heal the sick. I mean, what if what if your church sent you out and said, I want you to go out and heal the sick and to raise the dead, you know, and cure those with leprosy and cast out demons? Uh, I don't know. You'd be going, if the, if, if they send you out and you can do all those things uh, regularly and um, you know consistently, I'd say you probably got sent out by a really good church <laughs> with that. But uh, you know Jesus, he gave them his authority to go out, and you know back then he he generally proved that his message was true by these very signs, healing the sick and, and raising the dead and uh, curing those with leprosy and casting out demons. So he was giving them the ability to prove what they're teaching with the same signs and miracles that he himself did. And then he said, give as freely as you have received. You know, what did the disciples pay for these gifts? Nothing. They were given by God, right? Uh, through Jesus Christ. And you know, we too with the gospel were to give it as freely as you have received it. Don't uh, 
you know, charge for it. Don't uh, put people in bondage to it or something like that. We just give the word of God because he freely forgave us of our sins. Remember, uh, the gift of God, the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. It's a gift with that. So, and then he gives them a little more instructions about this. Verse 9, he says, now don't take any money in your belts. So don't take any money with you in your money belts. No gold, no silver, or even copper coin coins. Verse 10 says, and don't carry a traveler's bag with a change of clothes and sandals or even a walking stick. And don't hesitate to accept hospitality because those who work deserve to be fed. So he's saying, don't take everything with you. You're going to be depending on God. You know, there wasn't a lot of preparation that, that he had them do. You know, he didn't, they didn't have to take a course in survival or, or, you know, panhandling or anything like that. He said, but don't take money with you and your money belts, no silver, gold, or copper. You know, you'd be depending on your resources. And we want you to depend on God. Can you imagine uh, today being a missionary and, and sent into some foreign countries where the culture is so much different than it is with us and uh, maybe food standards and water standards and, and just their, their habits and traditions are, you know, hardly for us to recognize. An example of that might be I, I um, read about a missionary couple, couple that went to Africa. Now, uh, they were a young couple and, and they were very um, young. And, and so, you know, as we get older, we tend to put on a little more weight and things. Well, they were young and they were slim in the whole thing, but people looked down on them because his wife was slim. In Africa, it's a sign that you're being really good to your wife if, if she's fattened up a little bit. <laughs> so she actually had to put on some weight in order to reach the culture there. Well, here too, though, uh, he's saying that you don't need to depend on yourself. So don't take your many belts your gold or silver or even copper coins. You know, we want you depending on God. And sometimes, you know, in our life too, we're supposed to, we Christians, all of us, not just those called to ministry in, in you know, in like a, a pastor kind of sense or something, but all Christians, we're supposed to live by faith. That means we obey Jesus Christ, and and sometimes that takes faith, isn't it? It's, uh, we give when we when we see the need, and uh, we count on Jesus to give us when we have the need to give to us. And that's what he's saying here. And he says in verse ten, "Don't carry a traveler's bag. Don't even pack a suitcase, right? With a change of clothes or sandals or even a walking stick. You know, don't go out and procure a walking stick because you're going to go hiking now." He said, "Don't do that stuff. Don't hesitate also to accept hospitality when people offer you food." Or if you need a change of clothes or, or whatever you need, he says, don't hesitate to accept it. That's that's possibly God moving in, in your behalf. And, you know, God blesses those who give, too. So don't take the blessing away from them by refusing their hospitality as well. Right. So because why? Because those who work deserve to be fed. You know, preaching the gospel is doing kingdom work. Now, to, to a lot of people in the world, that, that might not mean much, but to God, it means a lot. And to people who are believers in Christ, we understand the importance of it, and it does have value and everything. So we need to uh, just continue on with that, with uh, walking in, in God's word there. Okay, so verse 11, and it says, Whenever you enter a city or a village, search for a worthy person and stay in his home until you leave town. Wow. So if you enter a city or village, so he's sending them to all the villages of Israel, right? He says, well, search for a worthy person. Now, a worthy person would be someone who receives the message of the kingdom of God. That would be a worthy one, right? And stay in his home until you leave town. You know, you might insult him if you found a better place to live or something. And so, well, I, I really like you. You're a good believer, but I found this other nicer place and everything. That might insult you. He says, no. So when you find a home, stay in that home until you're all done with your ministry and you leave that town. Verse 12. So when you enter the home, give it your blessing. You know, bless, ask for God's blessing on it. And verse 13 says, but if it turns out to be a worthy home, let your blessing stand. If it is not, take back the blessing. Now, that sounds kind of <laughs> strange, isn't it? You know, if they prove to be faithful to God, receiving God's methods, message and uh, and uh, just walking with the Lord, leave the blessing rest on the home. But back then they had a belief that if, if it doesn't, if the person proved to be unfaithful or something, you could take the blessing back. You could ask God to remove the blessing. And, and that, in a sense, would kind of lead them to, you know, lead them to their own. And uh, I don't know. It's not a good thing, is it? We'd like to leave the blessing. Let's go to page two now. On verse and verse 14 at the top of page two, he goes on giving some instructions about staying at other people's homes. Verse 14 says, If any household or town refuses to welcome you or listen to your message, shake its dust from your feet as you leave. 
You know, so if they go to a town or a household and they just reject them outright, like um, I think there was an instance in the Gospels where the apostles went to a town and, and they wouldn't have it. And um, a couple of the apostles asked Jesus, should we call on fire from heaven like Elijah the prophet did to come down and burn up the place? And, and Jesus said, no, you don't know what spirit you're of. You know, we don't do those kind of things, so to speak. But, you know, so if you go to a household or a town and it refuses to welcome you or to listen to your message, shake its dust from your feet as you leave. You know, so it says you don't have to stand there and argue with them and everything. Leave the town. But, you know, as a symbol, they would take off their sandals and clap them together to shake even the dust from there, meaning that we want nothing to do with you. You were offered, you refused it, and I'm determined not to have anything to do with you from here on out. And it was like really uh, to repudiate them and uh, to warn them about that. You know, he says in verse 15, what will happen to that town? Verse 15, it says, I tell you the truth, the wicked cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, will be better off than such a town on the day of judgment. You know, so he's telling the truth, the wicked cities uh, of Sodom and Gomorrah, remember in the Old Testament, uh, Sodom and Gomorrah in the book of Genesis, they were destroyed by fire and by brimstone from heaven. Why? Because of their sin. And, you know, um, they're a symbol to the Jewish people and, 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 and uh, you know, anyone reading the Bible that it's God's judgment and it's a permanent judgment. I mean, how do you restore it when they were completely destroyed by fire and, and brimstone falling from the sky? What happens was they, they thought uh, they, they're not certain exactly how God did that. But it appears that the, the city of Sodom and Gomorrah were on the southern tip of the of the Dead Sea. And... Um, at the time, there must have been a lot of sulfur in the ground, and the Dead Sea was filling up with water, and when the water overflowed and mixed with the sulfur, it would cause great explosions, blowing these fiery rocks into the air, and it just like it was just like getting bombed with fiery rocks, and we're not even certain where those cities were. They might be under the Dead Sea if it expanded that far or completely destroyed beyond you know having any sites uh, to find about them. But anyhow, he's saying in verse 15, I tell you the truth, the wicked cities of Sodom and Gomorrah will be better off then such a town on the day of judgment. You know, when the day of judgment comes and, you know, the, the, the cities of Sodom and, and Gomorrah uh, may have to stand judgment because they were wicked, so wicked that God destroyed them. He says, with these towns in the day of Jesus Christ, when they refuse the gospel of the kingdom, they're worse off than Sodom and Gomorrah. Why is that? Sodom and Gomorrah never had the gospel preached to them. And these cities had or had the opportunity anyhow to have it preached and they refused it and rejected them. So they'll judge, their judgment will be greater, he's saying. And now he tells them another way, uh, the state of mind uh, to go out there. Verse 16. Verse 16 says, Now look, he said, I am sending you out as sheep among wolves. How would you like to be a sheep uh, right among a herd of wolves? That doesn't sound good. He's well. I'm going to be like that. And what does he mean by that? Let's see. Let's see what he says here. Verse 16 again. Look, I am sending you out as sheep among wolves. So be as shrewd as snakes and harmless as doves. You know. So a sheep among a wolf better be pretty shrewd, <laughs> right? Well, you know, snakes were known for their shrewdness. Uh, snakes. Uh, sometimes I think the King James may use it, uh, sending you out, like out among serpents. Remember the serpent in the Garden of Eden, how he tricked Eve and and just played on her feelings and emotions and and desires and everything to get her to eat the forbidden fruit and sort of lied her right out of um, right out of what do you say? Utopia, right out of the Garden of Eden uh, with that. But he said, I'm sending you like sheep. You're harmless. A sheep, what does a sheep do to fight against the wolf? Uh, I don't know, rub them with wool, knit them a sweater. I don't know. But I'm looking, I'm sending you out as sheep among wolves. The other people, the wolves are the people who don't receive the message and rejected Christ. They're, they're a danger to, to the sheep, aren't they? So be as shrewd as snakes. Be wise and, and calculated in, in what you say and what you do, but be as harmless as dove. But be of always a good intent, a pure, innocent heart. And, you know, we have to be that way too, isn't it? We should be careful as we go out, be pure and innocent, but be wise in what we say too. Think it through, and uh, and and you know, calculate things. But never for their harm or or you know or your gain or your profit. But always for the profit of the kingdom. Okay, verse seventeen. A warning here. But beware. You know, notice that when when you read that in the Bible, and he says, "But beware." But beware, for you will be handed over to the courts, and will be flogged with whips in the synagogues. You will stand trial before governors and kings 
because you are my followers. But this will be your opportunity to tell the rulers and other unbelievers about me. So he's warning them now. He didn't say in verse 17, you might be. He said, verse 17, but beware for you will be handed over to the courts. Now the courts would be well, they could be the, the the Jewish court. Remember, the Jewish court had the power to to whip you or or imprison you or something, but they couldn't kill you. And you'll be flogged with whips in the synagogues. You know, their their own people, your own Jewish people, may do this to you. And you will stand trial before governors and kings. Now, that would be like the Romans or or the Gentiles. So, from coming within the nation of Israel, they they'd have opposition. And from coming without the, the outside the kingdom of Israel, they would also have uh, some condemnation or persecution. Verse 18 again, and you will stand trial in a court like, right, before governors, high officials, and kings. Why? Because you're my followers. You know, the Jewish people rejected them because they were the followers of Jesus Christ, and the Jews still wanted to hold on to the law of Moses. And and the Gentiles rejected them because they were followers of Christ. And, you know, the Roman government believed that Caesar was a god, and, and uh, to be safe with them, you had to proclaim Caesar to be God, and, and a Christian wouldn't do that. So uh, they'd end up standing before trials, before the Jews and, and, the, and the Romans or the Gentiles. So verse 18, you will stand trial before governors and kings because you are my followers. But, he says, but this will be your opportunity. You know, so often uh, people don't realize when they try to put people in, in stress like that, especially like a Christian, if the Christian is faithful to God, God can use that as an opportunity for his word to come out. And that's what he's saying. But this will be your opportunity to do what? To tell the rulers and other unbelievers about me. Isn't that so? You know, how would they ever get the chance to talk to a king or a governor or, or a judge or anything like that unless they end up in court before them? And God says, you know, it's important to reach the rulers because they're the ones who set the, the rules of the land often. They're the ones who uh, decide what's prosecutable and what's not prosecutable, what's good, what's bad, things like that. And so all they would ever hear about the word of God is what enemies of God would tell them. But when you get to stand before them, you know, that's when you get to share the gospel about that. And then he, he tells us something good that we needed to hear. Verse 19 says, so when you are arrested, he's talking to the disciples there, right? When you are arrested, not if you're going to be arrested, but when you are arrested, don't worry about how to respond or what to say. God will give you the right words at the right time. For it is not you who will be speaking, he says in verse 20. For it is not you who will be speaking. It'll be the spirit of your father speaking through you. Isn't that something? Now, some people try to use the scripture to say you don't have to prepare for sermons or you don't have to study the Bible. God will just give you the words. But that's not what he's saying. He's saying in emergencies like this, right? And when you are, are put before them and held captive and everything, uh, you know, you don't have to write a speech. He's saying God will give you the words. But, you know, it says in Colossians, I believe it's three six, how we should be careful in what we say and be prepared in, in what we speak to study, to know, and we should speak with grace and, and such. And so, you know, that we should study the word and be prepared. The Holy Spirit is a lot of trouble recalling things to our mind if we've never studied them, if they're not up there in the first place, right? So fill your, your mind and in your heart and your head with the word of God and God can use it at times too. But if you have a chance, you know, if you're going to speak somewhere, well, definitely prepare, right, uh, with that. But he's, he's telling them not to worry when they're arrested. God is going to be there with them and God will give them the right words to say. And then he describes what it's going to be like to be persecuted. Verse 21, a brother will betray his brother to death and a father will betray his own child and children will rebel against their parents and cause them to be killed. Isn't that something? You know, the Jews thought when family betrays family member that that's like the end of the time. That's, that's like the end of the world. But he's warning us that that's what was going to happen. And, you know, that's happened over the years where families are split, split over religion. Uh, they're split over whether they're followers of Christ or, or followers of the world. And that happens every day. And, you know, if, you, if you're in the wrong environment where the government is against you and ready to persecute you, uh, you, you as a father or mother could be killed by your own children uh, reporting you and things like that. And then verse 22 says, And all nations will hate you because you are my followers. You know, um, um, all hate nations probably hate a murderer or a thief or, or something like that. But, you know, he's saying, no, all, hate, all nations will hate you because you are my follower. There's coming a day where Christianity will be so rejected by the world that to be a Christian, you'll be hated by all the nations of the world. Let's read that verse again. Verse 22. And all nations will hate you because you are my followers. 
but everyone who endures to the end will be saved. You know, it's not enduring to the end that is going to save you. Uh, enduring to the end uh, just is an indication that you are saved, right? That you're faithful and, and, and you really are a follower of God. That's why you endured to the end and why you didn't betray the Lord and, and, and that. But he's, he's telling you there's a prize at the end. There's hope. Even, you know, even if we, we get persecuted all the way through the rest of our life, there's hope because in the end we'll be saved and that's going to be forever. This world is going to pass away. It's a very temporary place. And I really believe we're, we're nearing the end times. Uh, so, you know, uh, the Lord could come for us again before we even die our natural death. You know, he, very, he, he could. And uh, we should be ready for any time that he comes. So he gives him some advice here, verse 23. So when you are persecuted in one town, flee to the next. I tell you the truth. The Son of Man will return before you have reached all the towns of Israel. Isn't that something? So, you know, he says, if you go to a town and you're persecuted for it, you don't have to stay there. Use your judgment. What what should you do? Flee to the next town. You don't have to start, you don't have to buy a sword. You don't have to fight a battle. You don't have to stay there and argue. Uh, you don't have to. If you see you're going to get arrested, you don't have to stay around. You could leave town and go to another town if you can, right? And uh, he says, I tell you the truth, though, the Son of Man will return before you have reached all the towns of Israel. Now that phrase there, I tell you the truth, the Son of Man will return before you have reached all the towns of Israel. That phrase has a lot of different interpretations to a lot of different people. And it's not certain exactly what it's about. But they kind of believe, I think the general consensus uh, is that when he says, I tell you the truth, he says, this is how it's going to be. The Son of Man will return before you have reached all the towns of Israel. It's like it could be the end time. Well, he'll return before, uh, you know, every town in Israel is saved or, or maybe... Um, you know, he's coming back. It's possibly after his resurrection or so. It's just uncertain about the time frame. Is he talking to the disciples? Uh, they won't be going through all Israel before Jesus himself catches up with them. Is he talking about the disciples spreading the word after Jesus died, uh, before Jesus comes back again? Well, that apparently didn't happen, you know. Uh, or is he talking about some end time thing where, uh, like in the book of Revelation, it talks there's going to be, a, what, 144,000 uh, Jewish people that are going to be evangelists uh, during the tribulation period. And are they going to be going out, but he'll return before they even get done evangelizing? It could be, and that's probably one of the more likely situations here. So that's the end of the, the portion of uh, Matthew chapter 10 we're going to study today. That was the first 23 verses. And it's about sending out the disciples and uh, who who the, the apostles were and and uh, the rules of engagement, so to speak, right? Uh, don't take any money with you. Rely on God. Um, don't worry if you get arrested. God will give you words to say and everything like that. Um, uh, just a courtesy to people that take you in and things. And uh, remember how you're to behave and it's a dangerous world you're entering. So uh, you're like sheep among wolves. So be very wise, but always keep your good heart toward the Lord Jesus. You know, sometimes in our daily life, that's the case too, isn't it? You want to be a Christian. You want to uh, live right for God. But there's a lot of, sometimes a lot of thorns there and, and pokers and, and people that would try to trip you up or get you in an argument and things like that. But be careful. Be careful. Love the Lord. Keep your heart pure with God is, is, a, is a big thing here. So here we're seeing how Jesus was expanding his ministry to go out. And next week we'll finish this chapter, okay? So dear Lord, we just thank you for your word today. And, and God, help us to read it and help us to understand it, O Lord God. And, and Father, um, sometimes the message isn't completed in a chapter. And, and so we got to try to remember it uh, so the, the next week we can uh, get the, the full meaning of it. Lord, help us, Lord, to retain what we're reading, retain what we're hearing, O oh God. And Father, through your Spirit, help us to make sense of it. And Lord, help us to apply it in our life that we may better serve you. In Jesus' name we pray. So God bless you, and thank you for joining us today, and um, we'll hope to see you soon. Okay, bye-bye.